Is it then correct to say that no arrow could be the meaning, as every arrow could be meant the opposite way? Suppose we write down the scheme of saying and meaning by a column of arrows, one below the other. Three arrows are shown. Then if this scheme is to serve our purpose at all, it must show us which of the three levels is the level of meaning. I can, e.g., make a scheme with three levels, the bottom level always being the level of meaning. But adopt whatever model or scheme you may, it will have a bottom level, and there will be no such thing as an interpretation of that. To say in this case that every arrow can still be interpreted would only mean that I could always make a different model of saying and meaning which had one more level than the one I am using. Let us put it in this way. What one wishes to say is every sign is capable of interpretation, but the meaning mustn't be capable of interpretation. It is the last interpretation. Now I assume that you take the meaning to be a process accompanying the sign and that it is translatable into, and so far equivalent to, a further sign. You have therefore further to tell me what you take to be the distinguishing mark between a sign and the meaning. If you do so, e.g., by saying that the meaning is the arrow which you imagine, as opposed to any which you may draw or produce in any other way, you thereby say that you will call no further arrow an interpretation of the one which you have imagined. All this will become clearer if we consider what it is that really happens when we say a thing and mean what we say. Let us ask ourselves, if we say to someone, quote, I should be delighted to see you, quote, and mean it, does a conscious process run alongside these words, a process which could itself be translated into spoken words? This will hardly ever be the case. But let us imagine an instance in which it does happen. Supposing I had a habit of accompanying every English sentence, which I said aloud by a German sentence spoken to myself inwardly. If then, for some reason or other, you call the silent sentence the meaning of the one spoken aloud, the process of meaning accompanying the process of saying would be one which could itself be translated into outward signs, or before any sentence which we say aloud, we say its meaning whatever it may be, to ourselves in a kind of aside. An example, at least similar to the case we want, would be saying one thing and at the same time seeing a picture before our mind's eye, which is the meaning, and agrees or disagrees with what we say. Such cases and similar ones exist but they are not at all what happens as a rule when we say something and mean it or mean something else. There are, of course, real cases in which what we call meaning is a definite conscious process accompanying, preceding, or following the verbal expression and itself a verbal expression of some sort or translatable into one. A typical example of this is the aside on the stage. But what tempts us to think of the meaning of what we say as a process, essentially of the kind which we have described, is the analogy between the forms of expression to say something, to mean something, which seem to refer to two parallel processes. A process accompanying our words, which one might call the process of meaning them, is the modulation of the voice in which we speak the words, 
or one of the processes similar to this, like the play of facial expression. These accompany the spoken words not in the way a German sentence might accompany an English sentence, or writing a sentence accompany speaking a sentence, but in the sense in which the tune of a song accompanies its words. This tune corresponds to the feeling with which we say the sentence, and I wish to point out that this feeling is the expression with which the sentence is said, or something similar to this expression. Let us revert to our question, quote, what is the object of a thought, quote, e.g. when we say, I think that King's College is on fire. The question, as we put it, is already the expression of several confusions. This is shown by the mere fact that it almost sounds like a question of physics, like asking, what are the ultimate constituents of matter? It is a typically metaphysical question. The characteristic of a metaphysical question being that we express an unclarity about the grammar of words in the form of a scientific question. One of the origins of our problem is the twofold use of the propositional function, quote, I think X. We say, I think that so-and-so will happen or that so-and-so is the case. And also, I think just the same thing as he does. And we say, I expect him. And also, I expect that he will come. Compare, I expect him and I shoot him. We can't shoot him if he isn't there. This is how the question arises. How can we expect something that is not the case? How can we expect a fact which does not exist? The way out of this difficulty seems to be what we expect is not the fact, but a shadow of the fact. As it were, the next thing to the fact. We have said that this is only pushing the question one step further back. There are several origins to this idea of a shadow. One of them is this. We say, quote, surely two sentences of different languages can have the same sense, quote. And we argue, therefore, the sense is not the same as the sentence. And we ask the question, what is the sense? And we make of it a shadowy being, one of the many which we create when we wish to give meaning to substantives to which no material objects correspond. Another source of the idea of a shadow being the object of our thought is this. We imagine the shadow to be a picture, the intention of which cannot be questioned. That is, a picture which we don't interpret in order to understand it, but which we understand without interpreting it. Now there are pictures of which we should say that we interpret them, that is, translate them into a different kind of picture in order to understand them, and pictures of which we should say that we understand them immediately without any further interpretation. If you see a telegram written in cipher, and you know the key to this cipher, you will, in general, not say that you understand the telegram before you have translated it into ordinary language. Of course, you have only replaced one kind of symbols by another. And yet, if now you read the telegram in your language, no further process of interpretation will take place. Or rather, you may now, in certain cases, again translate this telegram say into a picture, but then too, you have only replaced one set of symbols by another. The shadow, as we think of it, is some sort of picture. In fact, something very much like an image which comes before our mind's eye. And this again is something not unlike a painted representation in the ordinary sense. A source of the idea of the shadow certainly is the fact that, in some cases, saying, hearing, or reading a sentence brings images before our mind's eye, images which, more or less, strictly correspond to the sentence, 
and which are, therefore, in a sense, translations of this sentence into a pictorial language. But it is absolutely essential for the picture which we imagine the shadow to be, that it is what I shall call a picture by similarity. I don't mean by this that it is a picture similar to what it is intended to represent, but that it is a picture which is correct only when it is similar to what it represents. One might use for this kind of picture the word copy. Roughly speaking, copies are good pictures when they can be easily mistaken for what they represent. A plane projection of one hemisphere of our terrestrial globe is not a picture by similarity or a copy in this sense. It would be conceivable that I portrayed someone's face by projecting it in some queer way. Though correctly, according to the adopted rule of projection, on a piece of paper, in such a way that no one would normally call the projection, quote, a good portrait of so-and-so, quote, because it would not look a bit like him. If we keep in mind the possibility of a picture which, though correct, has no similarity with its object, the interpolation of a shadow between the sentence and reality loses all point. For now the sentence itself can serve as such a shadow. The sentence is just such a picture which hasn't the slightest similarity to what it represents. If we were doubtful about how the sentence King's College is on fire can be a picture of King's College on fire, we need only ask ourselves, how should we explain what the sentence means? Such an explanation might consist of ostensive definitions. We should say, e.g., this is King's College, pointing to the building. This is a fire, pointing to a fire. This shows you the way in which words and things may be connected. The idea that that which we wish to happen must be present as a shadow in our wish is deeply rooted in our forms of expression. But in fact, we might say that it is only the next best absurdity to the one which we should really like to say. If it weren't too absurd, we should say that the fact which we wish for must be present in our wish. For how can we wish just this to happen if just this isn't present in our wish? It is quite true to say the mere shadow won't do, for it stops short before the object, and we want the wish to contain the object itself. We want that the wish that Mr. Smith should come into this room should wish that just Mr. Smith and no substitute should do the coming, and no substitute for that into my room, and no substitute for that. But this is exactly what we said. Our confusion could be described in this way. Quite in accordance with our usual form of expression, we think of the fact which we wish for as a thing which is not yet here, and to which, therefore, we cannot point. Now, in order to understand the grammar of our expression, quote, object of your wish, quote, let's just consider the answer which we give to the question, what is the object of your wish? The answer to this question, of course, is, I wish that so-and-so should happen. Now, what would the answer be if we went on asking, and what is the object of this wish? It could only consist in a repetition of our previous expression of the wish, or else in a translation into some other form of expression. We might, e.g., state what we wished in other words, or illustrate it by a picture, etc. Now, when we are under the impression that what we call the object of our wish is, as it were, a man who has not yet 
entered our room and therefore can't yet be seen, we imagine that any explanation of what it is we wish is only the next best thing to the explanation which would show the actual fact which we are afraid can't yet be shown as it has not yet entered. It is as though I said to someone, I am expecting Mr. Smith, and he asked me, who is Mr. Smith? And I answered, I can't show him to you now, as he isn't there. All I can show you is a picture of him. It then seems as though I could never entirely explain what I wished until it had actually happened. But of course, this is a delusion. The truth is that I needn't be able to give a better explanation of what I wished after the wish was fulfilled than before, for I might perfectly well have shown Mr. Smith to my friend and have shown him what coming in means and have shown him what my room is before Mr. Smith came into my room. Our difficulty could be put this way. We think about things, but how do these things enter into our thoughts? We think about Mr. Smith, but Mr. Smith need not be present. A picture of him won't do, for how are we to know whom it represents? In fact, no substitute for him will do. Then how can he himself be an object of our thoughts? I am here using the expression object of our thought in a way different from that in which I have used it before. I mean now a thing I am thinking about not that which I am thinking. We said the connection between our thinking or speaking about a man and the man himself was made when, in order to explain the meaning of the word Mr. Smith, we pointed to him saying, this is Mr. Smith. And there is nothing mysterious about this connection. I mean, there is no queer mental act which somehow conjures up Mr. Smith in our minds when he really isn't there. What makes it difficult to see that this is the connection is a peculiar form of expression of ordinary language, which makes it appear that the connection between our thought, or the expression of our thought, and the thing we think about must have subsisted during the act of thinking. If someone had said Napoleon was crowned in 1804, and we asked him, did you mean the man who won the Battle of Austerlitz? He might say, yes, I meant him. And the use of the past tense meant might make it appear as though the idea of Napoleon having won the Battle of Austerlitz must have been present in the man's mind when he said that Napoleon was crowned in 1804. Someone says, Mr. N will come to see me this afternoon. I ask, do you mean him? Pointing to someone present. And he answers, yes. In this conversation, a connection was established between the word Mr. N and Mr. N. But we are tempted to think that while my friend said, Mr. N will come to see me, and meant what he said, his mind must have made the connection. This is partly what makes us think of meaning or thinking as a peculiar mental activity. The word mental indicating that we mustn't expect to understand how these things work. What we said of thinking can also be applied to imagining. Someone says he imagines King's College on fire. We ask him, how do you know that it's King's College you imagine on fire? Couldn't it be a different building? Very much like it? In fact, is your imagination so absolutely exact that there might not be a dozen buildings whose representation your image could be? And you still say, there's no doubt, I imagine King's College and no other building. But can't saying this be making the very connection we want? For saying it is like writing the words, quote, portrait of Mr. So-and-so, quote, under a picture. It might have been that while you imagined King's College on fire, you said the words, King's College on fire.
but in very many cases, you certainly don't speak explanatory words in your mind while you have the image. And consider, even if you do, you are not going the whole way from your image to King's College, but merely only to the words King's College. The connection between these words and King's College was perhaps made at another time. The fault which in all our reasoning about these matters we are inclined to make is to think that images and experiences of all sorts, which are in some sense closely connected with each other, must be present in our mind at the same time. If we sing a tune we know by heart or say the alphabet, the notes or letters seem to hang together and each seems to draw the next after it as though they were a string of pearls in a box and by pulling out one pearl I pulled out the one following it. Now there is no doubt that having the visual image of a string of beads being pulled out of a box through a hole in the lid we should be inclined to say these beads must all have been together in the box before. But it is easy to see that this is making a hypothesis. I should have had the same image if the beads had gradually come into existence in the whole of the lid. We easily overlook the distinction between stating a conscious mental event and making a hypothesis about what one might call the mechanism of the mind. All the more as such hypotheses or pictures of the working of our mind are embodied in many of the forms of expression of our everyday language. The past tense meant in the sentence, I meant the man who won the Battle of Austerlitz, is part of such a picture, the mind being conceived as a place in which what we remember is kept stored before we express it. If I whistle a tune I know well and am interrupted in the middle, if then someone asked me, did you know how to go on? I should answer, yes, I did. What sort of process is this knowing how to go on? It might appear as though the whole continuation of the tune had to be present while I knew how to go on. Ask yourself such a question as, how long does it take to know how to go on? Or is it an instantaneous process? Aren't we making a mistake, like mixing up the existence of a gramophone record of a tune with the existence of the tune? And aren't we assuming that whenever a tune passes through existence, there must be some sort of a gramophone record of it from which it is played? Consider the following example. A gun is fired in my presence, and I say this crash wasn't as loud as I had expected. Someone asked me, how is this possible? Was there a crash louder than that of a gun in your imagination? I must confess that there was nothing of the sort. Now he says, then you didn't really expect a louder crash, but perhaps the shadow of one. And how did you know? that it was the shadow of a louder crash. Let's see what, in such a case, might really have happened. Perhaps, in waiting for the report, I opened my mouth, held on to something to steady myself, and perhaps I said, this is going to be terrible. Then, when the explosion was over, it wasn't so loud after all. Certain tensions in my body relax. But what is the connection between those tensions, opening my mouth, etc., and a real louder crash? Perhaps this connection was made by having heard such a crash and having had the experiences mentioned. Examine expressions like, quote, having an idea in one's mind, quote, quote, analyzing the idea before one's mind, quote in order not to be misled by them. See what really happens when, say, in writing a letter, you are looking for the words which correctly express the idea which is, quote, 
before your mind, quote. To say that we are trying to express the idea which is before our mind is to use a metaphor, one which very naturally suggests itself and which is all right so long as it doesn't mislead us when we are philosophizing. For when we recall what really happens in such cases, we find a great variety of processes, more or less, akin to each other. We might be inclined to say that in all such cases, at any rate, we are guided by something before our mind. But then the words guided and, quote, thing before our mind, quote, are used in as many senses as the words idea and, quote, expression of an idea, quote. The phrase to express an idea which is before our mind, quote, suggests that what we are trying to express in words is already expressed, only in a different language that this expression is before our mind's eye and that what we do is try to translate from the mental into the verbal language. In most cases, which we call, quote, expressing an idea, etc., something very different happens. Imagine what it is that happens. Imagine what it is that happens in cases such as this. I am groping for a word. Several words are suggested and I reject them. Finally, one is proposed and I say, that is what I meant. We should be inclined to say that the proof of the impossibility of trisecting the angle with ruler and compasses analyzes our idea of the trisection of an angle. But the proof gives us a new idea of trisection, one which we didn't have before the proof constructed it. The proof led us down a road which we were inclined to go but it led us away from where we were and didn't just show us clearly the place where we had been all the time. Let us now revert to the point where we said that we gain nothing by assuming that a shadow must intervene between the expression of our thought and the reality with which our thought is concerned. We said that if we wanted a picture of reality, the sentence itself is such a picture though not a picture by similarity. I have been trying in all this to remove the temptation to think that there must be what is called a mental process of thinking, hoping, wishing, believing, etc., independent of the process of expressing a thought, a hope, a wish, etc. And I want to give you the following rule of thumb. If you are puzzled about the nature of thought, belief, knowledge, and the like, substitute for the thought the expression of the thought, etc. The difficulty which lies in this substitution, and at the same time the whole point of it is this, the expression of belief, thought, etc. is just a sentence. And the sentence has sense only as a member of a system of language as one expression within a calculus. Now we are tempted to imagine this calculus, as it were, as a permanent background to every sentence which we say, and to think that although the sentence as written on a piece of paper or spoken stands isolated, in the mental act of thinking, the calculus is there, all in a lump. The mental act seems to perform in a miraculous way what could not be performed by any act of manipulating symbols. Now when the temptation to think that in some sense the whole calculus must be present at the same time vanishes, there is no more point in postulating the existence of a peculiar kind of mental act alongside of our expression. This, of course, doesn't mean that we have shown that peculiar acts of consciousness do not accompany the expressions of our thoughts. Only we no longer say that they must accompany them. 
quote, but the expression of our thoughts can always lie, for we may say one thing and mean another, quote. Imagine the many different things which happen when we say one thing and mean another. Make the following experiment. Say the sentence, quote, it is hot in this room, quote, and mean, quote, it is cold, quote. Observe closely what you are doing. We could easily imagine beings who do their private thinking by means of asides and who manage their lies by saying one thing aloud, following it up by an aside which says the opposite. Quote, but meaning, thinking, etc. are private experiences. They are not activities like writing, speaking, etc. Quote, but why shouldn't they be the specific private experiences of writing, the muscular, visual, tactile sensations of writing or speaking. Make the following experiment. Say and mean a sentence, e.g., quote, it will probably rain tomorrow, quote. Now think the same thought again. Mean what you just meant, but without saying anything, either aloud or to yourself. If thinking that it will rain tomorrow accompanied saying, that it will rain tomorrow, then just do the first activity and leave out the second. If thinking and speaking stood in the relation of the words and the melody of a song, we could leave out the speaking and do the thinking, just as we can sing the tune without the words. But can't one at any rate speak and leave out the thinking? Certainly, but observe what sort of thing you are doing if you speak without thinking. Observe, first of all, the process which we might call, quote, speaking and meaning what you speak, quote, is not necessarily distinguished from that of speaking thoughtlessly by what happens at the time when you speak. What distinguishes the two may very well be what happens before or after you speak. Suppose I tried deliberately to speak without thinking. What in fact would I do? I might read out a sentence from a book trying to read it automatically, that is, trying to prevent myself from following the sentence with images and sensations which otherwise it would produce. A way of doing this would be to concentrate my attention on something else while I was speaking the sentence, e.g. by pinching my skin hard while I was speaking. Put it this way, speaking a sentence without thinking consists in switching on speech and switching off certain accompaniments of speech. Now ask yourself, does thinking the sentence without speaking it consist in turning over the switch, switching on what we previously switched off and vice versa? That is, does thinking the sentence without speaking it now simply consist in keeping on what accompanied the words, but leaving out the words? Try to think the thoughts of a sentence without the sentence and see whether this is what happens. Let us sum up. If we scrutinize the usages which we make of such words as thinking, meaning, wishing, etc., going through this process rids us of the temptation to look for a peculiar act of thinking, independent of the act of expressing our thoughts and stowed away in some peculiar medium. We are no longer prevented by the established forms of expression from recognizing that the experience of thinking may be just the experience of saying or may consist of this experience plus others which accompany it. It is useful also to examine the following case. Suppose a multiplication is part of a sentence. Ask yourself what it is like to say the multiplication 7 times 5 equals 35, thinking it and, on the other hand, saying it without thinking. The scrutiny of the grammar of a word weakens the position of certain fixed standards of our expression, which had prevented us from seeing facts with unbiased eyes. Our investigation try to remove this bias, which forces us to think that the facts must conform to certain pictures embedded in our language. Meaning is one of the words of which one might say that they have odd jobs in our language. It is these words 
which cause most philosophical troubles. Imagine some institution. Most of its members have certain regular functions, functions which can easily be described, say, in the statutes of the institution. There are, on the other hand, some members who are employed for odd jobs, which nevertheless may be extremely important. What causes most trouble in philosophy is that we are tempted to describe the use of important, odd job words as though they were words with regular functions. The reason I postponed talking about personal experience was that thinking about this topic raises a host of philosophical difficulties which threaten to break up all our common sense notions about what we should commonly call the objects of our experience. And if we were struck by these problems, it might seem to us that all we have said about signs and about the various objects we mentioned in our examples may have to go into the melting pot. The situation, in a way, is typical in the study of philosophy, and one sometimes has described it by saying that no philosophical problem can be solved until all philosophical problems are solved, which means that as long as they aren't all solved, every new difficulty renders all our previous results questionable. To this statement, we can only give a rough answer if we are to speak about philosophy in such general terms. It is that every new problem which arises may put in question the position which our previous partial answers are to occupy in the final picture. One then speaks of having to reinterpret these previous results, and we should say they have to be placed in a different surrounding. Imagine we had to arrange the books of a library. When we begin, the books lie higgly-piggly on the floor. Now there would be many ways of sorting them and putting them in their places. One would be to take the books one by one and put each on the shelf in its right place. On the other hand, we might take up several books from the floor and put them in a row on a shelf merely in order to indicate that these books ought to go together in this order. In the course of arranging the library, this whole row of books will have to change its place. But it would be wrong to say that therefore putting them together on a shelf was no step towards the final result. In this case, in fact, it is pretty obvious that having put together books which belong together was a definite achievement, even though the whole row of them had to be shifted. But some of the greatest achievements in philosophy could only be compared with taking up some books which seem to belong together and putting them on different shelves. Nothing more being final about their positions than that they no longer lie side by side. The onlooker who doesn't know the difficulty of the task might well think, in such a case, that nothing at all had been achieved. The difficulty in philosophy is to say no more than we know, e.g. to see that when we have put two books together in their right order, we have not thereby put them in their final places. When we think about the relation of the objects surrounding us to our personal experiences of them, we are sometimes tempted to say that these personal experiences are the material of which reality consists. How this temptation arises will become clearer later on. When we think in this way, we seem to lose our firm hold on the objects surrounding us. And instead, we are left with a lot of separate personal experiences of different individuals. These personal experiences again seem vague and seem to be in constant flux. Our language seems not to have been made to describe them. We are tempted to think that in order to clear up such matters philosophically, 
Our ordinary language is too coarse, and we need a more subtle one. We seem to have made a discovery, which I could describe by saying that the ground on which we stood, and which appeared to be firm and reliable, was found to be boggy and unsafe. That is, this happens when we philosophize. For as soon as we revert to the standpoint of common sense, this general uncertainty disappears. This queer situation can be cleared up somewhat by looking at an example. In fact, a kind of parable illustrating the difficulty we are in and also showing the way out of this sort of difficulty. We have been told by popular scientists that the floor on which we stand is not solid as it appears to common sense, as it has been discovered that the wood consists of particles filling space so thinly that it can almost be called empty. This is liable to perplex us, for in a way, of course, we know that the floor is solid, or that if it isn't solid, this may be due to the wood being rotten, but not in its being composed of electrons. To say on this latter ground that the floor is not solid is to misuse language. For even if the particles were as big as grains of sand and as close together as these are in a sand heap, the floor would not be solid if it were composed of them in the sense in which a sand heap is composed of grains. Our perplexity was based on a misunderstanding. The picture of the thinly filled space had been wrongly applied. For this picture of the structure of matter was meant to explain the very phenomenon of solidity. As in this example, the word solidity was used wrongly and it seemed that we had shown that nothing really was solid. Just in this way, in stating our puzzles about the general vagueness of sense experience and about the flux of all phenomena, we are using the words flux and vagueness wrongly in a typically metaphysical way, namely without an antithesis, whereas in their context and everyday use, vagueness is opposed to clearness, flux to stability, inaccuracy to accuracy, and problem to solution. The very word problem, one might say, is misapplied when used for our philosophical troubles. These difficulties, as long as they are seen as problems, are tantalizing and appear insoluble. There is a temptation for me to say that only my own experience is real. I know that I see, hear, feel pains, etc., but not that anyone else does. I can't know this because I am I and they are they. On the other hand, I feel ashamed to say to anyone that my experience is the only real one. And I know that he will reply that he could say exactly the same thing about his experience. And this seems to lead to a silly quibble. Also, I am told, quote, if you pity someone for having pains, surely you must at least believe that he has pains, quote. But how could I even believe this? How can these words make sense to me? How could I even have come by the idea of another's experience? if there is no possibility of any evidence for it. And wasn't this a queer question to ask? Can't I believe that someone else has pains? Is it not quite easy to believe this? Is it an answer to say that things are as they appear to common sense? Again, needless to say, we don't feel these difficulties in ordinary life, nor is it true to say that we feel them when we scrutinize our experiences by introspection or make scientific investigations about them. But somehow, when we look at them in a certain way, our expression is liable to get into a tangle. It seems to us as though we had either the wrong pieces or not enough of them to put together our 
jigsaw puzzle. But they are all there, only all mixed up. And there is a further analogy between the jigsaw puzzle and our case. It's no use trying to apply force in fitting pieces together. All we should do is to look at them carefully and arrange them. There are propositions of which we may say that they describe facts in the material world, external world. Roughly speaking, they treat of physical objects, bodies, fluids, etc. I am not thinking in particular of the laws of the natural sciences, but of any such proposition as, quote, the tulips in our garden are in full bloom, quote, or, quote, Smith will come in any moment, quote. There are, on the other hand, propositions describing personal experiences, as when the subject in a psychological experiment describes his sense experiences, say his visual experience, independent of what bodies are actually before his eyes, and, nota bene, independent also of any processes which might be observed to take place in his retina, his nerves, his brain, or other parts of his body, that is, independent of both physical and physiological facts. At first sight, it may appear, but why it should can only become clear later, that here we have two kinds of worlds, worlds built of different materials, a mental world and a physical world. The mental world, in fact, is liable to be imagined as gaseous, or rather, ethereal. But let me remind you here of the queer role which the gaseous and the ethereal play in philosophy. When we perceive that a substantive is not used as what, in general, we should call the name of an object, and when, therefore, we can't help saying to ourselves that it is the name of an ethereal object. I mean, we already know the idea of ethereal objects as a subterfuge, when we are embarrassed about the grammar of certain words, and when all we know is that they are not used as names for material objects. This is a hint as to how the problem of the two materials, mind and matter, is going to dissolve. It seems to us sometimes as though the phenomena of personal experience were in a way phenomena in the upper strata of the atmosphere as opposed to the material phenomena which happen on the ground. There are views according to which these phenomena in the upper strata arise when the material phenomena reach a certain degree of complexity, e.g., that the mental phenomena, sense, experience, volition, etc., emerge when a type of animal body of a certain complexity has been evolved. There seems to be some obvious truth in this, for the amoeba certainly doesn't speak or write or discuss, whereas we do. On the other hand, the problem here arises which could be expressed by the question, quote, is it possible for a machine to think, quote, whether the action of this machine can be described and predicted by the laws of physics or possibly only by laws of a different kind, applying to the behavior of organisms. And the trouble which is expressed in this question is not really that we don't yet know a machine which could do the job. The question is not analogous to that which someone might have asked a hundred years ago, quote, can a machine liquefy gas, quote. The trouble is rather that the sentence, quote, a machine thinks, perceives, wishes, quote, seems somehow nonsensical. It is as though he had asked, quote, has the number three a color, quote, quote, what color could it be? as it obviously has none of the colors known to us. For in one aspect of the matter, personal experience, far from being the product of physical, chemical, physiological processes, seems to be the very basis of all that we say with any sense about such processes, 
Looking at it in this way, we are inclined to use our idea of a building material in yet another misleading way. And to say that the whole world, mental and physical, is made of one material only. When we look at everything that we know and can say about the world as resting upon personal experience, then what we know seems to lose a good deal of its value, reliability, and solidity. We are then inclined to say that it is all, quote, subjective, and, quote, subjective is used derogatorily, as when we say that an opinion is merely subjective, a matter of taste. Now, that this aspect should seem to shake the authority of experience and knowledge points to the fact that here our language is tempting us to draw some misleading analogy. This should remind us of the case when the popular scientist appeared to have shown us that the floor which we stand on is not really solid because it is made up of electrons. We are up against trouble caused by our way of expression. Another such trouble, closely akin, is expressed in the sentence, quote, I can only know that I have personal experiences, not that anyone else has, quote. Shall we then call it an unnecessary hypothesis that anyone else has personal experiences? But is it a hypothesis at all? For how can I even make the hypothesis if it transcends all possible experience? How could such a hypothesis be backed by meaning? Is it not like paper money, not backed by gold? It doesn't help if anyone tells us that, though we don't know whether the other person has pains, we certainly believe it when, for instance, we pity him. Certainly we shouldn't pity him if we didn't believe that he had pains. But is this a philosophical, a metaphysical belief? Does a realist pity me more than an idealist or a solipsist? In fact, the solipsist asks, quote, how can we believe that the other person has pain? What does it mean to believe this? How can the expression of such a supposition make sense, quote, now the answer of the common sense philosopher, and that, nota bene, is not the common sense man, who is as far from realism as from idealism. The answer of the common sense philosopher is that surely there is no difficulty in the idea of supposing, thinking, imagining that someone else has what I have. But the trouble with the realist is always that he does not solve but skip the difficulties which his adversaries see, though they too don't succeed in solving them. The realist answer for us just brings out the difficulty, for who argues like this overlooks the difference between different usages of the words, quote, to have and, quote, to imagine. Quote, A has a gold tooth, means that the tooth is in A's mouth. This may account for the fact that I am not able to see it. Now, in the case of his toothache, of which I say that I am not able to feel it because it is in his mouth, is not analogous to the case of the gold tooth. It is the apparent analogy, and again, the lack of analogy between these cases which causes our trouble. And it is this troublesome feature in our grammar which the realist does not notice. It is conceivable that I feel pain in a tooth in another man's mouth, and the man who says that he cannot feel the other's toothache is not denying this. The grammatical difficulty which we are in, we shall only see clearly if we get familiar with the idea of feeling pain in another person's body. For otherwise, in puzzling about this problem, we shall be liable to confuse our metaphysical proposition, quote, I can't feel his pain, quote, with the experiential proposition, quote, we can't have, heaven as a rule, pains in another person's tooth, quote. 
In this proposition, the word can't is used in the same way as in the proposition, quote, an iron nail can't scratch glass, quote. We could write this in the form, quote, experience teaches that an iron nail doesn't scratch glass, quote, thus doing away with the can't. In order to see that it is conceivable that one person should have pain in another person's body, one must examine what sort of facts we call criteria for a pain being in a certain place. It is easy to imagine the following case. When I see my hands, I am not always aware of their connection with the rest of my body. That is to say, I often see my hand moving, but don't see the arm which connects it to my torso, nor do I necessarily at the time check up on the arm's existence in any other way. Therefore, the hand may, for all I know, be connected to the body of a man standing beside me, or, of course, not to a human body at all. Suppose I feel a pain, which on the evidence of the pain alone, e.g. with closed eyes, I should call a pain in my left hand. Someone asked me to touch the painful spot with my right hand. I do so, and looking around, perceive that I am touching my neighbor's hand, meaning the hand connected to my neighbor's torso. Ask yourself, how do we know where to point to when we are asked to point to the painful spot? Can this sort of pointing be compared with pointing to a black spot on a sheet of paper when someone says, quote, point to the black spot on this sheet, quote? Suppose someone said, quote, you point to this spot because you know before you point that the pains are there, quote. Ask yourself, quote, what does it mean to know that the pains are there, quote? The word there refers to a locality. But in what space, i.e. a locality, in what sense? Do we know the place of pain in Euclidean space? So that when we know where we have pains, we know how far away from two of the walls in this room and from the floor? When I have pain in the tip of my finger and touch my tooth with it, is my pain now both a toothache and a pain in my finger? Certainly in one sense, the pain can be said to be located on the tooth. Is the reason why in this case it is wrong to say I have a toothache that in order to be in the tooth the pain should be one sixteenth of an inch away from the tip of my finger? Remember that the word where can refer to localities in many different senses. Many different grammatical games resembling each other more or less are played with this word. Think of the different uses of the numeral one. I may know where a thing is and then point to it by virtue of that knowledge. The knowledge tells me where to point to. We here conceive this knowledge as the condition for deliberately pointing to the object. Thus one can say, quote, I can point to the spot you mean because I see it, quote. Quote, I can direct you to the place because I know where it is. First turning to the right, etc., quote. Now one is inclined to say, quote, I must know where a thing is before I can point to it, quote. Perhaps you will feel less happy about saying, quote, I must know where a thing is before I can look at it. Sometimes, of course, it is correct to say this, but we are tempted to think that there is one particular psychical state or event, the knowledge of the place, which must precede every deliberate act of pointing moving towards, etc. Think of the analogous case, quote, one can only obey an order after having understood it, quote. If I point to the painful spot on my arm, in what sense can I be said to have known where the pain was before I pointed to the place? Before I pointed, I could have said, quote, the pain is in my left arm, quote. Supposing my arm had been covered with a meshwork of lines, numbered, in such a way that I could refer to any place on its surface, was it necessary that I should have been able to describe the painful spot by means of these coordinates before I could point to it? What I wish to say is that the act of pointing determines a place. This act of pointing, by the way, is not to be confused with that of finding 
the painful spot by probing. In fact, the two may lead to different results. 